Ah, <sighs> exclusives. Games that are only available on one console allow the product to be permanently associated with a brand and the console, and they can serve as mascots for that console too. When I say Xbox, most would respond with Halo, but I'm unsure if any of you would respond with much else. When the 8th generation of consoles was around the corner, I was quite torn on what to purchase, for no other reason than Insomniac's newest project, Sunset Overdrive. Microsoft was the only publisher to allow Insomniac to make their, at the time, most ambitious project, which highlights one of the great things about exclusives, because in exchange for their exclusivity, Insomniac was given full creative control. Unfortunately, the downside of exclusivity is also highlighted as Sunset Overdrive wasn't playable for those who opted for a competitor console or a computer. But this all changed when Sunset Overdrive came to PC. Now plenty of gamers like myself who missed out years ago can jump into Sunset City. Fortunately, the price point is pretty good because this game, like a million other games, is available on Game Pass. Which brings me to this video sponsor, Acer Predator and Game Pass. Something that naturally comes up as you continue to play and replay your favorite games is hardware and performance. That, to me and others, is the main reason that PC is so viable and attractive. Play every game on performance mode and fidelity mode at the same time. Get frame rates into the hundreds and play your favorite older games with a newfound fidelity and resolution. This is why the Acer family of products is perfect for getting your foot in the door. Specifically, the Predator Orion 7000, which is the mother of all battle stations, sporting a 12th generation Intel processor and a 30 series Nvidia graphics card. A lot of PCs can be tough to upgrade years down the line, so when you do feel the need to upgrade, which with specs like these I don't know if you'd want to anytime soon, you can do so easily as the system was built to have parts swapped in and out. And you can keep the frames high while keeping the temperatures low with their ARGB Frostblade fans. But of course, a price that few people factor in when purchasing a new PC is that you gotta pay for all those games. Games nowadays are 60 pounds like the brand new Rainbow Six Extraction and Back for Blood. Fortunately, these games are available on Game Pass, a month of which is included with the purchase of applicable Acer products. What other game is available on Game Pass and convince me to grab a subscription which is a dirt cheap 7 pounds a month? Cheaper than Netflix which is 9 pounds a month? You guessed it. Sunset Overdrive. Of course, there are other games here too, like Halo Infinite and one of my personal favorites, Tetris Effect, all of which can be run like a dream on the Acer Predator Orion 7000. My god, that is a mouthful. So if that at all interests you, then feel free to grab one using the link in the description and the pinned comment. I do need to make it clear though that all the opinions in this video are my own, and it is not my job here to review or promote Sunset Overdrive. And the opinions given in this video have not been reviewed or cleared by today's sponsors. With that said, let's get back on topic. While Sunset Overdrive was initially going to be a more real realistic and grounded idea of the apocalypse, the final product ended up being a brighter, funner, and more punk interpretation of the apocalypse, or as the developers often referred to it, the awesome apocalypse, which much like funner, isn't a real word. So let's jump, bounce, and grind into Sunset City and take a look back at the greatest Xbox exclusive eight years later. Something to make clear about Sunset Overdrive is that fun is a top priority. It doesn't concern itself with a compelling plot or even explanations for why you're doing the things you are. That's not to say more plot-intensive games aren't good, but rather, in the case of an apocalyptic game that takes a far grittier approach, the plot can be good and engaging, but not fun in the traditional sense. Punchlines and self-referential dialogue are where the writing locks its gaze, and it leads to a game that thanks to such humorous writing and consists of jokes that constantly hit more than they miss, which on occasion they admittedly do, we get a gauntlet of humor that doesn't really Really let up. This is reflective of the game's greater aesthetic of a beer-buzzed rock and roll playground. The world here, while looking like a city, functions more like an obstacle course or arguably a skate park, and traversing it through the grinding of different edges in the same way you would a Tony Hawk game instills this teenage rebellion. You'll be whizzing through Sunset City's different districts experiencing different architectural themes, ranging from industrial to commercial and eventually residential. Buildings are covered in awnings, fans, solar panels, and just about everything else to bounce from, which means that even without intentionally looking for them, you'll likely land on something that will simply send you back to the skyline, where a majority of your traversal takes place. It's fortunate then that this game is still pretty to this day, and runs quite well too. I had no frame drops on my first playthrough, and of course, I experienced some frame drops when recording because it's a fucking curse at this point, but overall, the game was stable and generally bug-free. Cutscenes look great, and different variations of OD are much like a majority of the game, bright and colorful, though they look borderline black and white when compared to the other colors on the screen, of which the weapons produce an overpowering amount of flames, electric shocks, and freezing to make the environment during the more hectic 
climactic moments look as though a rainbow paint palette spilt onto your screen. While the flames fired from the appropriately named Compensator, a shotgun shaped like a penis that shoots incinerary rounds, can overpower the other elements of the screen, I wouldn't use the word overwhelming. The game is as chaotic as it gets, but it's never to a point where I lost track of myself or whatever objective was in front of me. That's not to say I never fumbled a string of well-placed grinds and hops because of misinputs or lack of attention. I did. A lot. But it was never the fault of the game, and in every case, it was because of my own shortcomings or lack of understanding at that point. By the end of my adventure, I found myself seamlessly traversing Sunset City in a fluid dance of swinging, grinding, wall running, air dashes, and it, much like any good traversal system, was rewarding from start to finish. The UI here shares the rebellious, near cartoonish aesthetic of Sunset Overdrive, but also does not crowd your view, which is appreciated. The near constant simulation in Sunset Overdrive is shared by its soundtrack, which could easily annoy or even bore a player if it wasn't filled to the brim with catchy, accessible rock and roll that scores every action you take. These headbangers consist of a solid mix of both original and licensed tunes, allowing you to feel fully immersed in this lackadaisical rebellion. Character and enemy designs range from great to goofy, and all the aforementioned aspects of the presentation allow Sunset Overdrive to drive home a fun apocalypse that feels more animated than it may seem at first. Granted, the character designs are bound to please any players, as there is a pretty in-depth character creator here. And because of how fun it was to experiment with different outfits, I ended up doing something I often don't do, which is ignoring the canon outfit. You may notice that in most reviews I do, where different outfits are selectable, I often stick with whatever the canon one is. But because of how expressive and varied the clothing is here, I found myself having more fun engaging with what did ultimately boil down to playing dress up with my character. There are the basics like tattered and paint splattered shirts and sweaters, to skirts, shin pads, and anything else that can be loose, tight, or bright. I was even able to get my hands on an outfit that bared some striking Muslim inspirations, if looks could kill. I also experimented with other outfits, and upon unlocking a sizable sword that would put the buster sword to shame, I did my best to make my character look like a scuffed Dante. The character creator is truly a crime against my editor, because every recording session started with 30 minutes of fiddling around and finding the perfect part so my character can fit perfectly within the rebellious aesthetic. But of course, a game's aesthetics can only take it so far, and a badass soundtrack and art style can be severely limited if its gameplay is subpar. Something interesting about Sunset Overdrive, though, is that this was Insomniac's first open world game, and further, it was their first game that put a heavy emphasis on traversal. Sunset City is a utopia with nothing to stop you from enjoying it to your heart's content, but there's only one rule. Don't stop moving. Traversal is the lifeblood of this game and everything you do, be that combat, collecting, or just cruising around. It's a system that encourages the same rebellious nature that the rest of the game does, and there's many ways Insomniac encourages you to engage with its traversal, one of which is simple but works effectively. There are a ton of open world games with an emphasis on traversal, where making use of the fun and in-depth traversal can be less efficient than just hoofing it to your destination. Take games like Assassin's Creed Brotherhood. While I enjoyed the movement, it was often faster to sprint on the ground if I wanted to get around quickly, and horse is even worse than this. Of course, scaling anything vertically in the sheer style in which you do it is encouragement enough, but in Sunset Overdrive, walking is painfully slow, and I believe it's intentional. When you are forced to traverse hundreds of meters of cityscape with no access to vehicles and a slow run speed, you'll be forced to learn not only how to engage with the traversal, but to get good at it. One could argue that the fast travel feature undermines this, but I believe it's only in place to prevent completionists from wanting to blow their brains out. Something that makes a traversal unique is that it really only sees you pressing three buttons, and this simplicity and accessibility allows a traversal to be easy to learn and hard to master. But the difficulty in mastering it is due to imprecision, a product of its easy controls. Every surface that isn't the ground in Sunset City can be used to your advantage and plays some kind of role in your movement. Walls can be run along, corners can allow you to transfer momentum from one side of it to the other, rails and other edges can be grinded along, and if that grindable object is in the air, then you can swing below it, swapping between above and below a wire. If you jump and swing upwards at the same time, you even get a boosted swing. A myriad of objects act as bounce pads, be that cars, skylights, vents, and just about anything else that protrudes from a roof. But no matter what you do or how you explore the environment, it all starts with a jump and a core pillar of the movement. Tapping the A button is the beginning of every chain and will be used in multiple scenarios to get yourself back into the air or to eject from a wall. If you press the A button when landing on a bounce pad, you'll give yourself a boost. And the other button you'll be frequently pressing is the X button. If you're playing on keyboard and mouse, I got nothing for you and God help you. The X button allows you to grind, swing, and wall run. The final button you'll be pressing occasionally is RB, which just gives you a boost when grinding and a dash in the air. Your entire arsenal of tools revolves around three buttons and while it works 99% percent of the time, I believe with some tweaking, it could have worked all of the time. 
For an example of that 1%, we can look at one of the points challenges where you have to do multiple passes of a pier, one where you swing from pole to pole and another where you grind from rail to rail. An issue I ran into was that I was swinging when I meant to grind and grinding when I meant to swing. And while this isn't a problem with enough accuracy, the accuracy required was far too precise, especially compared to the rest of the game. Across a playthrough, you'll notice that bounce pads can almost be entirely missed, but their effects still felt, and the same goes for barely catching onto ledges. The traversal on the whole, and actually the game as a whole, is very forgiving, so that leads me to believe that the issue present is with the controls fighting each other. I believe a simple solution is to map the swing button to A and holding A only. That way you don't get it mixed up when jumping, which would require only a tap. I think there is an upside to having everything that you horizontally do being mapped to X with the vertical to A, but I think in this case, the exception would have been helpful. Focusing back on the 99%, the traversal is honestly spectacular. There's nothing more fun than getting from point A to B while looking stylish and chaining together grinds, flips, and wall runs. Ultimately, this is one of the most solid traversal systems I've used in a game, and it strikes a great balance between ease of use and complexity, which is appreciated doubly so when you realize that you're almost always moving, especially in combat. The shooting here is much like everything else, forgiving and fun. On paper, the combat seems as though it's easy, as you only have to aim in the direction of a nearby enemy for your reticle to lock onto them, which makes aiming really easy, but that's only half of the equation, with the other half being the aforementioned movement. Enemies here are accurate and hit hard, so the best way to avoid getting hit is to continuously bounce grind and ultimately not stay in one spot for too long. While grinding isn't hard and neither is shooting, it's the combination of the two that is hard. The sheer number of enemies means that you can't have a lopsided playstyle, and every encounter turns into this juggling act. If done with precision, it can lead to immense reward, and if not, then a game over. Your greatest tool will always be your multitasking ability, but if you are struggling, you can fall back on your assortment of weapons. I already mentioned the flaming compensator, but the selection here really is varied. A few of the other early unlocks will be the Dirty Harry and Nothing But The Hits, which focuses both on individual target removal and crowd control respectively. Harry is capable of taking down the human enemies quite quickly and with minimal bullets, but doesn't function well against some more monstrous foes as shooting one enemy isn't going to make much of a dent when their population of their hordes enters the hundreds, which is where the records come in. They do a small amount of damage but have the ability to bounce between enemies, making taking down a large horde far more manageable. As you collect more currencies like overcharge and money, all of which are found by smashing open boxes, completing challenges, and defeating enemies, you can buy upgraded versions of these weapons, and entirely new ones with my favorites being the charge beam. It is exactly how it sounds, as it just shoots a shredding beam of energy that cuts through most enemies and bosses. While the acid sprinkler, TN Teddy, and the dude are all great picks, why bother experimenting with them at all? That question might seem ridiculous at first, because obviously Obviously, your inclination would be just seeing what the different weapons have to offer, but you aren't completely encouraged to do so. Once you use a weapon enough, it will level up, and receive a damage increase as well as unlock amps which further the usefulness of the weapon. So if you find a weapon that tears through OD and you continue to use it, it only makes the disparity in effectiveness between it and the other weapons even greater. The encouragement you do get is that certain classes of enemies have certain weaknesses. The OD are weak to flaming and otherwise hot weapons, and on the flip side I found single shot high impact weapons work best against scabs, and the same was true for the robots, but I opted for the classic AKFU, which hit them with constant high impact damage. Using the AK on the OD wouldn't produce the same results, so swapping weapons and finding the right tools for the job is a task that is never really completed, until you've tried just about everything. So while it can be easy for some to fall into the trap of using the same three weapons even outside of their elemental strengths, each have their own more situational uses that encourage experimentation and the constant swapping of weapons, because while the Flaming Compensator can torch a crowd of infected, the dude would be better for taking out an entire line of Lebowskis, and if you disagree then, well, you know, that's just like, uh, your opinion, man. And maybe you'd rather go for the Acid Sprinkler that applies a corrosive effect to anyone within range. Every weapon has its use here, except for the Charge Beam. That thing doesn't discriminate, it'll destroy everything. But it's expensive as hell and it runs through a lot of ammo, which is another deterrent from sticking with one weapon for too long. Ammo isn't necessarily a problem in this game like it might be in other shooters, and it was rare for me to run out of ammo, especially on the more common weapons. However, conserving the ammo for your BFGs was always something I reminded myself of, as it would be tough to take down a Harker with just the Dirty Harry, but using a TN and Teddy mixed with the Acid Sprinkler would make things far easier. The Herker is just one of many mini-bosses within Sunset City, along with the Fizco tanks, which share the qualities of doing a lot of damage and taking a shitload too. All of the enemies here, apart from knowing what weapon to use, go down the same way, but just take different priorities over one another. A Winger would be at the top for me, because I can't outrun it, as it can fly and the Muggers would be right below, as they do the most damage. The Poppers are pretty low because they can't really do damage unless they get close, and they often won't if you're traversing properly. Traversing the city while in combat is integral 
realize it makes you harder to hit and it boosts your style meter too. The style meter is a gauge of how badass you look while slaughtering those unlucky enough to be in your way. It fills a little bit with each kill, bounce, and grind, and when one of its four bars fill, you get a special buff, which can actually be chosen by you. Since each tier is harder to reach than the last, each buff is better. Once you have all the bars filled, then, well, I'll let the game itself explain it. And that about sums it up. By the time you get comfortable with the gameplay and have a solid selection of amps, and you'll be causing mayhem with each battle. One of my favorite max style amps was one where, whenever I'd be grinding, I'd have fire shooting out from behind me. And when the OD are weak to fire, you can see how chaotic yet efficient the combat gets. Badges are other buffs that strengthen your character, and they offer things like more damage with certain guns or certain enemies, or allowing certain actions like grinding to reward more style. There are further amps and badges, such as the ones that let you take a free melee hit, ones that allowed any melee strike to generate a tornado, and countless others, and truly go Going in depth with them would be a waste of time, because whether I cover 5 or 50, the sentiment is still the same. There's a great sense of unique juvenile disobedience to every playthrough and every build. One of the reviews I watched of this game, which you should also watch, is from Mayor Hairbear, who, rather appropriately, rocked a kangaroo jockstrap and acid sprinkler for the entirety of their playthrough, contrasting my more grounded character design and reliance on the AK. Of course, the varied hordes of bots, bandits, and biters are all in good fun, but there are a few boss fights throughout the game that are surprisingly amusing. The only half criticism I have for these bad boys is that they aren't very challenging. Sure, they may seem challenging as their attacks can easily take you from full to half health, but as with any other enemy in the game, constant movement makes bullets borderline bend around you. Just because these fights are easy doesn't mean that they aren't fun, because these are some of the most memorable and entertaining fights for their jokes and their scale. The first you come across is against a giant inflatable fizzy, which was easy as you just dodge some attacks, bounce on some pads, and then shoot his eyes out. But the ever-increasingly frustrated dialogue of the child-friendly balloon was entertaining from start to finish. It was a test to see if you're capable of properly bouncing and grinding while shooting. But the next boss fight against Norton is much the same, as you have to grind along his scaled back to take him down, making use of your weapons and eventually grabbing your style meter through through the fourth wall. A similar boss fight is had against the King Scab, which was one of my least favorites just because it didn't feel as massive or mechanically challenging as the others. I could have easily seen this being the first boss fight in the game, but the disappointment was remedied by the final boss, which is the Fizco headquarters itself. This literal skyscraper traverses much of the map, and we have to chase it down and scale it to shoot its core, with again, hilarious dialogue. This mechanically felt no different than those before it, but having a boss fight that is in essence the city itself was interesting. Our final challenge is in a massive enemy we have to shoot, which I guess we do eventually shoot, but the real challenge is keeping up with the building. Every building and district in the city has turned from a playground into an obstacle course, and thematically it was rewarding to take a trip through the districts you previously conquered to take down the final enemy. While the combat and traversal here is fun from start to finish, it isn't all you do. Sunset Overdrive has a great mix of objectives. You'll often have interesting things to do no matter where you are on the map, but that doesn't mean some of the side quests and challenges don't grind that line between stimulation and tedium. To highlight that, we can look at the actual side quests here. I say actual side quests because there are also a large handful of challenges and time trials around here too that we'll cover after. The side quests fall into a few different categories. The first is collectibles. The entire quest, usually broken up into three or four parts, see you traveling to different parts of the map to grab different objects, and your reward is often pieces of a clothing set, overcharge, or money. At first, I liked this, as they saw me collecting items in each district, but then it hit me that I'd be doing this four separate times. Sometimes it is mixed up, such as one where I had to collect comic books for a fellow named Stanley, or when I had to raise some resistance flags, each requiring me to defend the flag for 30 seconds. I don't think these missions on their own commit any crimes, but the pure repetition of them are what made me scoff whenever they came up. There's a total of 12 of these missions, and that is just way too many for me. Fortunately, the meat of the side quests are a good amount of fun. One of my favorites was where you had to take the core of the fizzy bot and bring it to different machines, and his dialogue made the side quest. Are you carrying me? Oh, kick your hands off me! Why don't you put me back in there? I've got a fortune right here! Others saw you trying out new traps and weapons, defending a pirate's island from wingers using catapults, and doing side quests for the LARPers in Fargarthia. The dialogue and goofy circumstances were what carried these otherwise dull objectives, and I only wish we had some more memorable and out there ideas like we saw in the story missions. I wanted more missions where you traverse the city as it's covered in lava, and in a drug trip context, the game could have gotten super weird, but that didn't happen. Instead, we just get different variations of go here and kill X, and while that premise isn't a bad thing if something interesting is tied to it, here there usually isn't, and the writing isn't always able to pick up the slack. 
Once you complete all the side quests, you'll come across a really meta quest that sees you collecting the side quest markers from the previous people you've helped out. And the entire mission is a meta commentary on completionist side quests, and they even answer the question of why we complete literally every side quest in a game. And the answer is simple, yet understood by the developers. The reward. Too bad the reward kind of stunk, as it's just a hoodie, but whatever, reward's a reward. The side activity that you can engage with are the collectibles and amp creations. To create an amp, you'll need to defend the overcharged machines while hordes of OD are trying to break in. The den defenses are fun enough and are some of the more challenging tasks in the game. With the assistance of traps that you place, defending against the OD is challenging as you typically have multiple entry points to keep track of. Taking out OD quickly and moving from one barricade to another even faster is where the combat and traversal are in perfect harmony, and the reward is truly great. You can't craft a lot of these amps unless you nab some of the collectibles around the map, which makes the long treks from each end of the map more enjoyable, as I'd be stopping midway to grab toilet paper, shoes, or whatever else is around. Seeing all the high points on the map even grabbed me the Assassin's Creed themed outfit, which I wore for almost all of the traversal challenges. It just felt so right. The most abundant of challenges here are the simple traversal races. They see you moving through rings with speed, and while I enjoyed these a lot, they didn't often require much thought or skill from the player. I was able to get the gold on almost every challenge on my first attempt, and perhaps that's due to the traversal being on the forgiving side, but I think an extra challenge or perhaps a platinum rating that sits high above the gold rating that required near perfection would have inclined me to return to these more often. Locking more overcharge in the outfits behind these hypothetical platinum rankings would be helpful too. I can at least say that the actual routes you take were interesting and gave me greater ideas for how I myself could traverse the world. Before completing these challenges, I found myself not making use of the wall run, and after seeing how much farther I could spread my movement-based wings, I incorporated it a lot more. In a similar vein to the traversal systems are the bomb deliveries, which to me were a lot of fun. They just see you at a starting point and having three to five delivery points that happen to be scab hideouts. Deliver the bombs in whatever order you like, so long as it's fast. I enjoyed these more because it offered me more freedom. The traversal challenges were not about getting from point A to B, it was about executing the proper moves and pressing the right buttons at the right time. Delivering the bombs put the route that you take on you, which made it more engaging for me and encouraged me to try different routes as I would think to myself, maybe I could have tried a different order of delivering items. A final movement challenge in the same vein is the points challenges. They see you in an area with an assortment of points to grab from one to five, often ones being in low spots with fives being in the more hard to reach places. Finding the best route to collect all of these was fun and they were often the hardest challenges, though that doesn't say a lot. The weapon challenges are some of the most fun for a few reasons. The first is that they allow you to experiment with weapons you haven't purchased yet, preventing you from wasting money on a weapon you don't like. They were also fun because they took a little more thought than the traversal-based challenges. Slamming a mountain of OD never gets old, and these weapon challenges are a testament to that. Furthermore, the Buck National challenges saw you taking down OD in more specific ways. Grinding, bouncing, and melee kills among other requirements keep things somewhat fresh, but the fact that the same three requirements rotate with no variation made me not bored, but just kind of made me go through the motions. I will admit that the final Buck challenge which sees you using catapults was a great time. The glider challenges were a snooze. They just see you using the glider from an earlier mission that moves slow as hell to either shoot down some obstacles or move through hoops. These challenges weren't abundant, but I'd be lying if I said I cared at all for them. The same sentiment is shared for the smash challenges, which just sees you finding the most efficient way to smash a lot of objects with only your melee weapon. If you want the golds, you'll need to build up style while you do this so you can activate the different melee buffs requiring more thought, but ultimately these challenges were nothing to write home about. I can't appreciate the incentive to experiment, I'm in no way saying that they're a waste of time, but rather they are mildly enjoyable side distractions, which is arguably what a side quest should be. I only wish there were more challenging across the board, but perhaps this is a problem I created for myself as I only started completing them after the main story. The missions within the plot are obviously the best. Even otherwise menial tasks like walking a dog are fun because you get a unique weapon. Replacing the teddy bears that would otherwise be shot from the rocket launcher with a robot dog allows you to shoot it across a map and this gizmo will tear apart any OD within its vicinity, so using it to fight was a ton of fun. It's almost as if the game looked at you and said, oh, you think we're going to make you walk a dog? Literally? Very funny. Which is diminished a little when the game side quests see you just running around the map collecting comics, but the point still stands. Even a quest like taking down 99 robots is an insane amount of fun because you have a sword that shoots lightning, fire, and does an insane amount of damage that turns an otherwise menial task into a highlight for the game. And of course, we can't forget when the entire city is flooded with lava, my favorite mission in the game. The other advantage the main plot has going for it are the locales. Each mission takes you to a new part of the map, and you often make an actual impact on these locales too, as showcased by a mission 
section where you have to drain a flooded part of the town, which is followed up by a harpoon-assisted ascent up a high-rise. I could drone on about how much fun the main plot is, but I feel I'm almost doing it a disservice by talking purely about the gameplay, because the writing and the jokes are what make it so much fun. The plot begins with an event known as Horror Night. After the launch of the new drink from the Fizco conglomerate that controls the city called Overcharge, people begin mutating and morphing into different forms of monsters called Overcharge Drinkers, or OD. We are unfortunately a lowlife who spent the Horror Night as a janitor, and we're at ground zero before running home and barricading ourselves inside. After we run out of supplies and are almost killed by the OD, we're saved by an older fella named Walter, who grumpily shows you the ropes of surviving. As you work with Walter to build him a new plane after you broke his first one, we join him in escaping the city by air, but unfortunately an invisible wall, yes an invisible wall, causes Walter and the player to crash but not before Walt can push us out, sacrificing himself. In order to get parts for the plane the player made, they ended up becoming friends with a bunch of Oxford students, one of which named Sam who points the player in the direction of Troop Bushido, a bunch of scouts hiding out in a museum. As we help them we are also introduced to the LARPing Fargarthians, who help us build a boat to get out of the city. As we are almost out we get word that Fizco, in order to destroy the evidence of what happened in Sunset City are going to nuke the shit out of it, and our character has a change of heart, realizing that they need to go back and save their friends and the city. In attempts to enlist the help of the La Catrinas, the player does some favors for them and eventually gets access to the Fizco headquarters, where the supposed weapons are being held. Upon sacrificing ourselves to destroy the building, the player regrets their choice and decides instead to not die, resulting in the reveal that the weapon is the building itself. We take down the building and everyone celebrates, though our celebration has a dark undertone as we're shown a large amount of overcharge being carried out of the city, hinting at a sequel we never got and likely never will see. It's pretty obvious that the plot here isn't anything special. Our character has a very jarring and frankly unconvincing arc. The plot is full of contrivances and the ending felt really shallow, but I don't care. The story was focused entirely on humor and fun above all else, and this is reflected in every portion of this game, from its challenges to its mechanics. I'm not saying there aren't issues here that you can't want more, in fact, I did want more, but I don't think the game was going for anything more complicated or sophisticated than what it gave us, and I can't help but love what they did give us. The characters here, especially the Fizgo mascot, was hilarious, as were most of the side characters like Floyd, the Oxfords, and it all falls apart without the main character. The player character is a smartass the entire time, and in a lot of cases feels really grounded despite such strange circumstances. They're all yours, kid. Show me what you got. What do you mean, show me what I got? Help me! I think both voice actors did a great job with their lines, though I do feel that the female voice actor did a better job, hence why I stuck with them. Ultimately, this is going to be as subjective as it gets, and I think the humor falls in the same boat. An issue that can arise with the humor in this game is that the entire plot lives and dies on it. If you don't find this game funny, or find the wise-ass self-referential humor entertaining, you'll probably hate Sunset Overdrive. Entire plot points revolve around hilariously stupid meta-concepts, like escaping the city, the punchline of which is a literal invisible wall, poking fun at other open-world games that do the same thing. I do, however, think these jokes hit, such as when your real-time weapon wheel comes up as you meet Buck. I got guns too. Damn! But how do I know you can use them? I'm an American! I don't know how else to explain how fun this game is without just showing a million clips of the different jokes and dialogues, so I'll spare you. There are a ton of jokes like this throughout the story, and according to other reviews I've seen, it's agreed that this game is pretty funny. But I highly recommend that you watch the first or second cutscene before committing to the game, because again, if you don't find it funny, you'll find it grating by the end of the game. As far as grievances go, what I mentioned above is just about it. The game ends very abruptly, and while I can't appreciate a game that doesn't bother dragging things out if it doesn't have to, a little more of a conclusion like what the player and their friends will do now that the threat is gone would have been nice. I also think that the character's sudden change of heart as they escape the city is a little bit out of nowhere. They explain that before Horror Night they were a nobody, simply coasting through life, but they've now found a new purpose. I can't tell if this is intentionally underdeveloped or not, because while this could have been interesting to explore more, I wonder if it would have clashed with the game's tone, hence why it was cut back. I believe this is true for the plot contrivances too, which are directly referenced in the game, and the simplification of the plot is shown off too. How do we communicate with Sam when neither of us is holding a phone? Uh, you know, technology. Let's not complicate things by poking holes in the way we deliver the story. There are a lot of decisions that the developers made here that are done purely for the sake of the game, and I appreciated that. It doesn't bother with overcomplicating the plot or explaining every little detail, and rather, it uses its humor as a way of distracting from that. It's a lot like how video essays and long-form reviews will have title cards separating parts of their videos to make them seem more credible and sophisticated than they actually are, using their editing skills to compensate for poor writing or a lack of comprehension with the game they're covering. Oh fuck. Overall, Sunset Overdrive is a perfect, turn-your-brain-off kind of game. The entire aesthetic of the game spells out its priority of being just a game. 
I saw a tweet the other day that said not every game needs to be some massive open world that spans 50 plus hours. Sometimes a good 5 to 10 hour experience is all you need. And that's exactly what this game is. It's just a casual experience that while not having the same massive AAA staples we know today, still succeeds in being enjoyable. And the love put into this game is easy to see from every screenshot, clip, or review. And I hope my love for this game has shown through this review. I appreciate Sunset Overdrive most for how well it's aged. It's been 8 years since its release and yet it feels like this game and its gameplay specific is as timeless as ever. All of this makes this a game I cannot recommend enough, and especially on PC where it runs like a dream, and it's included in Game Pass. And remember, you can grab a free month of Game Pass with the purchase of any Acer product, like the Predator Orion 7000, which you can purchase using the link in the description or in the pinned comment. And thank you again to Acer for sponsoring today's video and allowing me to revisit what has turned into one of my favorite games from last generation. Sunset Overdrive is a testament to the need for some games to just be video games. I touched on this in my Guardians of the Galaxy video, but some people just want a game. Not a world-ending 80-hour plot that touches on dark subjects and makes the player question their morals or beliefs. Those types of games are great, and they truly leave an impact on someone. But we shouldn't forget that sometimes, the best games are the ones we play just for the sake of playing. After a long day of work, where you can crack open a cold one and just enjoy yourself. And damn, I enjoyed Sunset Overdrive. Hello everyone, thank you for making it to the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please let me know. And if you didn't, also let me know that down below. And uh, I just want to give a quick shout out to the people who make these kinds of videos possible, our Patreon and YouTube members. Ben Conway, Bishop Nelson, Bossian, Bryce Stevens, Chiefy, Chris, Gonzo Gonzalez, Jake the Lemur, J.MP3, Mark Short, Pyrite, Ryan Hutcherson, Sean Bailey, The Game Alorian, Toyota Jeff, and Alfhednar845719. For YouTube members, we have Breeze Over, Daniel Latow, Lane, Worshipper of the Olympians, Sad AMV, and It's SRTW. I'm sorry, I don't. Is it like It's It's Sertu? It's Sertu? I don't know. I appreciate it, anyways, man. Like, thank you. <laughs> I uh, I really appreciate all of the new members and patrons. I hope you guys have been liking the newer videos, and I appreciate our friend Sean for editing this video. You can find his links all in the description and in the pinned comment. And I just wanna say I appreciate your guys' support and reception on the latest videos. Uh, last few videos on this channel have done really well and they've been received really well too. And so I hope that I am uh, continuing to improve. Not every video is going to be the best, but I, I hope I can continue to give you guys good shit. So follow me on Twitter if you want uh, updates and anything else to do with me. And you can join my Discord server if you like. We have a lot of fun down there. And uh, yeah, I love you guys. I hope you're having a good day or night or week for that matter. And take care of yourselves. Stay healthy. Bye.